I'm Shamar, I'm here to moderate the final session, the final panel of today, uh, Recreating the Village, How Do We Rebuild? Um, I just want to bring our, our hearts and minds back in and let us focus on what uh, Dr. Carpenter, mm -hmm, I'm going to speak that into existence, what she was teaching us, right? She told us about being a young person and what it feels like to have that fire and to have no one reciprocate that in your community from an elder perspective. So I'm going to take a page out of uh, Mother Norma Freeman's book and say that we're sorry from the stage of the planning committee because we plan this event. It's on a Sunday afternoon from 12 to 5. It's 90 degrees outside. We're in a church and there's no food. So how do we expect young people to be here? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I've been a youth development professional for 15 years. So if we want young people to come, we have to make it relevant for them. We can't make it comfortable for us and expect them to come in and engage with us. No, we've got to conform. As the leaders, as the models, we have to conform what we do to bring those folks into the movement. So again, for all the young folks that are out there, for the ones that are not there, the ones that are going to see this later, our bad. We promise that next time we will do better because this isn't the last time that we'll be here at this table. Yes. How do we rebuild? We have a wonderful array of panelists here. I'll let them introduce themselves and just give us a snippet of answering that question. Or actually, just tell us what you're already doing in community, because we know that these are young people who are on the ground making change every single day. So introduce yourselves and tell us really quickly about the work you're doing. And we'll start um, at the end with Amanda King. Hello. Oh, OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, this was a great forum. Like, I've really enjoyed the conversation so far. It's been very rich, and I really love spaces like this, and I wish there were more. My name is Amanda King. I am an artist activist, and um, I run a program, Shooting Without Bullets, which is a photography and expressive arts program that helps black and brown youth process complex social problems through the medium of creative arts. And that is the work that I'm doing in my community because I believe that cr tapping into that creative power can help young people change the entire infrastructure of uh, the city of Cleveland, their communities, their personal lives and well-being. So I really want to tap into sort of their self-esteem, their creative energy, and their ability to process the things that are coming their way. So that's what I'm doing in the community, but I'm also on this thing called the Cleveland Community Police Commission. Um, that is not where the truth of my work lies. Um, and I also am a consultant for the Tamir Rice Afrocentric Cultural Center, which is the expansion of my work. So being a person who has created a program for youth to a person who designs space for youth, and that's very important to me. And shout out to Amanda. She had an opening of her uh, exhibit last night at Spaces Gallery. So some of us who were here yesterday were here there last night. But we have to celebrate these successes, right? We heard that on the earlier panel. So let's celebrate our young folks. Hi, my name is Chanel Miller. Right now, I'm actually doing a lot. Um, I'm working with Paul Sabine on the Glenville documentary about the shootout that happened in 1968. I'm currently a part of the Cleveland Police Foundation organization. Um, we are part of a program that is teaching you how to interact with the police, what's going on in community, how can you fix it, but honestly having real conversations about it, and it's all organized with youth. People are just now coming into high school, dealing with high school students, and actually kids that are younger than that. It's about teaching them about the real world, how the world works, uh, politics, and everything like that. Um, right now, what I'm also dealing with besides the internship is me just going out and telling the youth about the Glenville history. Um, I'm a firm believer in if you know your history, you can make your future better. You learn from it, you take lessons from it, and that's how you fix it. So right now, I'm just all about informing the youth. All right, good afternoon. My name is Dante Gibbs, and um, things that I'm doing in community, I'm from East Cleveland. 
So just right down the street, um, graduated from Case Western Reserve University um, from the Mandale School and I did my undergraduate here as well. But some work that I'm doing in community, um, in my former role working at Neighborhood Leadership Institute, I developed a program called FLOW, which stands for Future Leaders of the World, and it's basically looking at young people as, a, as using their expertise to actually come up with solutions in their neighborhoods, talk about them so they develop um, speeches, and then we took those speeches and published them into a book called Out of the Mouths of Babes. And so during my um, time at NLI, or Neighborhood Leadership Institute, we produced over 80 um, young authors and so that was something that we were able to do across the um, city and the region. So most of the students came from Cleveland, East Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, even Shaker Heights, and um, various neighborhoods on the west side of Cleveland and east side, such as Huff and Glenville. Um, other things that I do in community, um, my friends and I, we do an event called Turkey Takeover, which services um, this area that we're in now, every Thanksgiving we give away 1,000 turkeys and over 20,000 pounds of fresh produce. And we pick an asset within the East Cleveland community. So whether that's the 72 Jones Health Center or City Hall or the newly um, built Salvation Army and we host it there. So that way people get to see the places that we have to offer and that are a service to us. And then for Christmas, we do Dante's Gift Express. And so we basically surprise families within East Cleveland with a gift, a family gift that they can enjoy as a family um, on Christmas Eve. And so we partner with the city, um, the city police department, and we sort of reiterate sort of that term community policing. So East Cleveland is sort of small enough to where we, kn we know most of our officers, I won't say all, but um, just them being able to see officers in a different light. And outside of that, I mentor formally and informally um, with young people. And so that's pretty much who I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexis Crosby, and I am a third generation Glenville resident. I grew up in Glenville like my father did and like my grandmother did after my great grandfather brought his family there and raised them. Um, and I graduated from Glenville High School and attended Case Western Reserve University. And actually, the first time I worked with youth was because Miss Janice placed me at my old high school <laughs> to run a, pro, a project step up site, which at that time was focused on helping uh, young, young men really navigate the transition into high school. So teetering off for subject really dealing with you know, conflict res resolution, how to not end up suspended because you have a conflict with a teacher <laughs> or somebody else. You know, those kind of practical things that nobody thinks about sometimes. Um, and because of that, I kind of really changed my pathway. You know, I told Janice, you convinced all of us that we want to work in community and now we're so busy <laughs> that when you call us, we have crazy schedules. <laughs> um, I have spent the last few years really focusing on youth development. I currently run an after school program at a high school, at Euclid High School. But prior to that, I really focused on helping our kids and kids that didn't have uh, potential access to um, tech careers and engineering, learning those skill sets, being exposed to those opportunities um, in Cleveland, but also in Northeast Ohio, so in Youngstown, Lorraine, you know, just kind of all over the region. So, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kristen Farmer, and I have family history in both Glenville and Huff. Um, I was born and raised in Huff. I'm not currently living in the Glenville neighborhood. And I founded an organization called Birthing Beautiful Communities about four years ago. And in general, people may think that it's in response to Cleveland's embarrassing uh, infant mortality rate amongst black babies in particular. Um, as of now, July of 2018, the disparity in uh, black and white infant death is, has widened. Um, so for every white baby that dies in the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, nine black babies die. 
um, in our city and within our county. Um, so I created this organization to not only address the health inequities, but just to address all inequities. And so my goal is around true equity, and I'm very outspoken about that, and um, how important culture is um, within our, the context of the equity in which we seek, just like the famous quote, if you wish, be the change that you wish to see. And so within our organization, we have 20 women who are doulas, and most people don't know what a doula is, so don't feel bad if you don't. It is a birth worker or a birth coach and attendant. Um, black women are more likely to want a doula present at their uh, labor and delivery, but may not be able to afford the services because it costs between $500 and $2,500 to hire a private doula. So um, our organization is free of charge, and we provide perinatal supportive services primarily to women of color in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County for 80 weeks. So we are um, in early intervention in a prenatal period. We attend a labor and delivery, and we're with the baby until the baby is at least a year old. And we can go beyond that because we know that we don't want our babies to just thrive until they are a year old. We want them to thrive well beyond that. And how can we recreate that village and use that collectivism that is deeply embedded in our culture and who we are as a people? How do we put that back into our communities and say that this is our problem and it is our issue to fix? And so how do we look at the systemic uh, structures that have created this? We have to go back before we can really move forward. And how do we recreate that village concept and also how do, what the economic equity, how does that play a role into this? So each of our birth workers start off making $20 an hour. They are paid, paid a flat fee of $500 every time they, intent, they attend a birth, and that is very intentional because they stay with the women and they support them so much. You know, it's sort of this concept around how are they able to support people when they can't support themselves. And so with that, you know, being we notice, my background is in community development, though I am a birth worker and I have been a birth worker for many years, but how do we melt the community development how do we make community wealth meet community health and stop having co separate conversations about what we know exists within our communities which are true inequities oh. Um, same person I was 20 minutes ago, Allison Carpenter. Um, uh, just a little bit more, I, I uh, said I work for the mayor. Um, my background is in community development, um, and I still work uh, alongside the Women's March, translating um, grassroots energy into national movements, um, but also still trying to find my way back home and figure out how I can be a part of solutions here. Thank you to the panelists for sharing that. Uh, the next question that I want to pose is kind of a, it's not a question, it's actually a complete the sentence. Um, in my work, I need, so I would like for each panelist to address the group and tell us what you need. And I'm going to say this, nobody say you need money, right? <laughs> That's the easy way out. You know, I mean, we all need money, right? That's, we can talk about that, but right now we have these bodies in the room. We can think about resources as money, but also as time and also as people. So what do you need? In my work, um, because it is hybrid work, so it is activism, it is policy work, and it is visual arts, I need respect in every aspect of that. Respect me as an artist. Respect me as someone who can write policy. Respect me as an educator. And respect me as an organizer, somebody who can bring people together and talk about and then influence or at least try to influence change. I can tell you how so much I do not get respect across the board. And I work 14 hour days, literally. And respect looks like money. Respect looks like when I have the mic, although I am 29 years old, it looks like you respecting me in the way that you would a 49-year-old white male speaking, right? Because my life experiences as a young black woman are just as even more so important than his experience as a white male. We walk and we navigate society and the world differently. And so black women, especially if we're young, especially if our hair is wild, 
and our clothes are cool, we don't get the respect that we deserve. And so I can always say that I need more respect because the way that I move, the education that I have, and the hard work ethic that I, that I carry, if anybody else that didn't look like me had it, they would, they would be able to sustain themselves. And every day I'm looking at myself, how do I do, how can I, how can I continue on like this? You know, like skipping meals, not paying bills, but still, every time the community asks, I'm out there. Every time institutions ask, I'm out there. Every time a gallery wants a show that they want a couple black folks to be at, I'm there, mm -hmm. you know? And so what I need is respect. I just wanna say, I, yes, like, oh my God, like, I'm I, I'm not surprised, but I'm thankful you just said that because not only like us as like black people, but also being a black woman, you need respect, but in my field, like I said, I love to inform youth on history and everything like that and want them to be more involved, like she said when she was speaking, um, like Allison said, but it's like the one thing I need is for young youth to care. You know, let's be honest, we live in, well, in my area, we live in a day and age where a child has a mindset or a teenager has a mindset, if it don't got nothing to do with me, I'm mind my business. And it should not be like that. You know, we always say, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, for a child to be successful, he needs these resources, he needs these parents, he needs these people who are engaged in his life and who want to pave a way for him to be successful. But. It also depends upon the child. We need that child to care. We need that child to not only know his history, but have the drive, like she said, to want to pursue that success. I mean, let's be honest. When I sit here and I be like, oh, well, this happened in 68. Do you not realize but that when this revolution was happening, these were 15-year-olds, these were 14-year-olds, these were 13-year-olds out on that front line saying, I want respect. I want to be acknowledged. I want to have equality. I see what my parents go through with police brutality or any type of oppression, and I want that for myself. But yet, when we live in this day and age, it's, I mean, it didn't hurt me. So I'm gonna mind my business. It should not be like that. And like someone said yesterday, there is a two generation gap. There are like two generations like that were just missing. From 68, from the adults that were around that time or the teenagers that were around that time, to now. Why is it that I did not know about this story when I first entered Glenville High School? Because I've been living in Glenville area like my whole life. Why is it that I'm just now knowing about these successes, these people who spoke out that were around my age? Why am I just now hearing about that? That's because it's a generation gap. We need to fill that gap. If a child does not know his or her success back then from different generations, then they're gonna be ignorant. They're gonna turn a deaf ear because to them, ignorance is bliss. The more you know, the more either you're gonna be successful or you're just gonna be like, it's gonna cause you stress. Like, you gotta think, we touched on so many topics yesterday. So many, like the five pillars, we touched on so many topics. That's why I was so upset that not that many youth came out to hear those topics. Like I said yesterday, for this area to be successful, it does not only need this generation that's like prominent right now that's in this room, but it needs people of our generation like this on this table. It doesn't need to, not just constantly rehear the story, but the generation I am needs to grasp it and care about it and needs to show its interest in it because once it shows its interest, it's gonna take that person far. That is the whole point of it. I need youth to care, not just to take action in it or not to join internships because of the money because like we're young kids, money is our number one thing. That's what we need right now, let's be honest. But we need that emotion, we need that drive. I need young people to care. I need you to be interested, I need you to be invested. That's exactly what we need. To not just hear the story over and over again, but to understand it, comprehend it, and take it. Um, to add to respect and care, I would say trust. We need trust. Um, we need trust that um, our experiences are valuable, that what we have to say um, is, is worthy of your attention. The same way we have your attention today, 
at 4.30 on Sunday. We need that attention tomorrow. We needed it yesterday for sure, but we definitely need it tomorrow and, and throughout our time that we're here on this earth to make a difference because without that trust, we don't have that space to create, to innovate and produce. And so the very famous phrase of being the change that we seek, we're doing that change. We just need that space. We need that trust that, okay, if our choices is not in line to what you think it should be, trust us that we will get there. We will get to that point. Um, and so that's why I would say we just need trust. So, yeah, I, no, you didn't. I'm, I'm not going to say what anyone else said because I, I validate that. Yep, just yes, yes, and yes. Um, but I would say the major thing that we need, especially if you deal with young people on a day-to-day -day basis, is to not dim their light. Mm. I mean, don't dim my light, but I'm tough. I, you can, you'll tell me I can't do something, and I'll say, I'll show you. Watch me. But a lot, of, a lot of people are not those people. Don't dim a kid's light when they say, I don't think college is for me, but I wanna do this journeyman's program or this certificate program that's gonna pay me well and give me ability to sustain my family. Because it's not a reflection on you that they're not gonna get a bachelor's degree. And it might surprise some people that know me personally because I'm very academic. But I also recognize that not everyone is going to take that path. And I feel like, and because I work with young people, like, I feel like what dims kids' lights the most is their parents and their caregivers because they feel like it's a reflection on them if their child does not sign up for college in the fall after they graduate from high school. They feel like I didn't do my job if my kid is not going to college, no matter what else they said they're going to do. So don't dim your kid's light and don't dim their fire. Like if they care about something, if they truly, truly care about something, don't dim their fire. Because what you're gonna get is someone who cares about nothing because you, you didn't support the thing they truly cared about. All great things that we all need. Thank, thank you all for saying everything that was on my mind too. Um, the thing that I would say, I need soldiers. I need people who are willing to be selfless. I need people who are willing to be courageous. I need people who are willing to be in their positions of influence and power and actually utilize that for the greater good of us all. Um, I need people to come out of their shells. Um, I need people to stop believing that because they have what they believe security and a job that pays well and a benefits package that as long as they're good, that's it. That every people don't, you know, everyone else um, go out and get theirs or what they are because I understand that that takes sacrifices. Um, but someone sacrificed for you to be here, right? And, you know, I also need opportunity. I always say, you know, give me the opportunity. I can handle the rest. Um, I think that, you know, no one has gotten to where they are today by someone not giving them an opportunity. You're here because you were given an opportunity and it's our duty and responsibility to give other people opportunities so that they do have that space to be creative and that space to be passionate. Impossible is just an opinion. We have everything that we need inside of us to make whatever work that we are granted to do while we are on this earth to do that. You know, we're here for a period of time and we all have a job and it's our work, our life work, not the job that you get up and you go to every day, but the work that you get up, you live, you eat, you sleep and you breathe. That's what I need, are people who are willing to be fearless in our, I won't say struggle because we've already been there and we're, we're, we have become immune to struggling, but to see the light at the end of the tunnel and think beyond our lifetime you know, and I always use the Beyonce phrase for the Carters, if anybody uh, listened to that album, you yes, know, my great grandchildren are already rich. Yes. I want my great grandchildren to already be rich, not rich just in monetary, but within passion, within spirit, within compassion. And with people, when are we going to invest in people, human capital? Um, I need room to grow, to 
to learn. I need some space. Okay, and I say that on a panel like this because, you know, I stand here and boldly tell you guys I don't think, you know, that the way we do things are the right way. And I know the immediate follow-up question is, well, then what is the right way? And my response to you is, well, I'm trying to figure that out too. You know, and I think that for some time, for some people, that's not satisfactory. You know, they, we're young, we're on fire, but that doesn't mean that we have all the answers yet. Right? This is a journey and every day I'm trying to get better and I need that room from, you know, not just from elders but from my peers to allow me to grow, allow me to learn, allow me to get better and to not ex have the expectation that at 22 or that at 29 or at 50 or even at 70 that I have it all figured out, that I, that I have reached my cap. You know, as we go along this work and this movement building, we have to give ourselves room and give ourselves the opportunity to, to not have all the answers, but to work together to figure that out. And so room is definitely it. We don't need to stress ourselves out and put so much pressure that we're not useful tools for the movement um, and, and definitely prioritizing self-care uh, and not exhausting ourselves, trying to be superheroes for our communities. Thank you. Thank you again to the panelists. Now we want to open it up for some uh, questions, some dialogue. We have time for two questions from the audience, and for each question, we'll take two responses from the panel. Uh, raise your hand, the microphone will come to you. And I just really want to stress that questions, not comments. Please don't push your program. Questions. Um, I would love to know what it would take to encourage more youth to show up at community groups, um, their council meetings, their ward meetings, the neighbor up meetings, because we always want youth there and we want to hear you, but we don't know if it's just the food or if it's something else that we need to draw in. So. Um, I would say, you know, it might be just the food, but I'm not, well, I can speak for myself, but um, when I look at the people from my community, well, the kids or my peers from my community, the only way you engage them is you, if you make it apply to them specifically. Let's say like, as we were talking about socioeconomic and housing and everything like that, you would think, oh, well that applies to my parent, that really don't apply to me. You do realize if they up the taxes or property tax on your house and your parent is on a fixed income and they can't pay for that house, that affects you because your whole family is gonna be homeless. You need to make it apply to them so they can care. If you sit here and say, oh, your high school is about to get shut down due to low testing or this and that, and they're an athlete and they really care about their school, that's going to push, like, if you put a bug in their ear, not saying that's really about to get shut down, but if you put a bug in their ear, now times 10, that's going to make them want to go harder, especially if they're an athlete and they're saying, oh, I'm just going to get in on a football scholarship or a basketball scholarship, and that's it. Oh no, it ain't gonna work that way. Do you not realize when you get to college and you sit here, you about to play that college football, that college basketball or anything else, that if you can't keep them grades up, they're taking away that scholarship and kicking you out? You need to make certain issues that they think apply to other people or their parents apply to them. That's the only way from my perspective that a young kid is gonna care. Don't make it just a parent issue. Don't make it just a kid that don't play sports issue. You need to make it apply to them. And if they still don't, then that's gonna be a person, they have to experience life firsthand. And then they will get the grasp of, oh my God, like this is life, this is really what it is. And that's what's gonna put a fire up under them. Uh, so uh. as a, someone who went, whose job was it was to go to community meetings, let me first say that community meetings can be boring, right? Like let's be honest, like sometimes you don't feel like it affects you. And so my advice is to make them a part of it. Not just ask them to come, but give them a permanent role in that meeting. No one wants to just come to a meeting and just sit week after week and just hear other people. Make them a part of it. If there are positions on a, on a, on a community organization, elect them to it. The one example I can give is that once I ran for that position, there were no Howard students, no young people at those community meetings when I was a commissioner. After I got elected, every person that has held my seat since I was held that seat, I was the youngest person ever elected, until the next, my successor, was another 18-year-old girl. Ever since I left that seat, there's been a young person in that seat, and we brought our friends to the meeting because we had a role. You know, it was, we're not, it's not a meeting that we're invited to, it's our meeting. And so if you give people, if you give them some stake in it, some equity in it, then it becomes not just something they're invited to, but something that they're a part of.
And I would just add that we just need, um, we want to challenge everyone that hosts these meetings to walk it like they talk it. And so we need to see exactly what it is that you're, you're doing. We need to have that time to even build that relationship with you. So as Alan said, being a part of that um, community meeting, we need to know what it is that you actually care about outside of just having our voice for that time. But do we actually see you in community? Do we, do we see you at the grocery store? Do we see you at the park? Do, you, do we see you at any event that we have? And so once we begin to see that, you might see us more. And I just want to add, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just, but before, I know we're late on time, and I just want to add, and I want to challenge you to think about meetings differently. Because mm -hmm. uh, most of us on this panel, most of us on, these pan on this panel work with young people. They do not want to sit through your meeting. Man. They might come because you've convinced them it's important, but they do not want to sit through your meeting. I promise you. I promise you. I don't necessarily want to sit through your meeting either, and I'm older. Tell the truth. Because if we meet 10 times about something and we don't have any resolutions, I have wasted all my time. Yes, that's the truth. I could have given that to something else that's actually going to shake. And that's, and that's, you know, just being 100% honest with you. If we're, if we're meeting, if we're meeting, we're meeting and nothing's happening, you've lost my attention. I'm moving on to the next thing. Because you have to remember, you want the youth, but youth are about action. They're not, you might bring some booking around it, you might bring the knowledge, you might bring expertise, but youth are about action. And if you spend too long without action, they're not going to see the value in wasting their time there, because they're going to feel like it's a waste of time. And they may be respectful about it, but they're going to bow out. The other thing is, is that I feel like n most community organizations, not all, do not utilize social media effectively for youth. Yes. Facebook Live your meetings. You have a council meeting, Facebook Live your meetings. I guarantee you the kid's parent is going to see it and the kid is going to see it. Instagram your meetings or Instagram the topics that are going to be on your meetings to get the word out. If you're not, leave Twitter alone because it's dead to them. They don't care. <laughs> Snapchat your memes because I guarantee you they're going to see it. So I think we have to think about meeting differently and our expectations of youth because if you expect them to sit through 10 meetings or 15 meetings, because I've been to meetings with elders and y'all get long winded and y'all take a long time to come to resolutions. She's telling the truth. She's telling the truth. Y'all might and not I love like you it, all, but she's telling the and truth. And I love you all, but y'all get along with it, and y'all get a long time to come to resolutions. It's not that difficult with us. Even if we don't agree, we'll come to a common goal and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And you can't, it's, it's, it's got to be a blending of generations because we're going we're gonna to react differently. Because we're passionate. We're idealistic. We don't believe, and we're not all that into hierarchy. So we're not too worried about what the mayor thinks, and then we got to go through the council first, like, okay, so what can we actually do? And I, I want to, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> and let us not get disillusioned by what Alexis is telling us, right? We might be in our feelings a little bit. Ooh, elders talk long. There, there's, a there's a time for storytelling. There is a time for information sharing. There is another time for action. We've got to get clear around when is the time to tell the stories and when is the time to put the boots on the ground and start doing the work. Young people are here to do the work. Yes, we are listening to you. We are gleaning this information. We can't do it without you, but we need you all to understand where our orientation to this is. Our orientation is to the activism. That's where we are situated. So, Yes, we need those stories, but we've got to begin to understand that there's a time for those and then there's a time for action. So we've got to be able to split those two. Mm -hmm. The question in the back. My name is Gary Cantor. Uh, I'm very engaged in the uh, police reform consent decree. Uh, as a fellow young person, I'd like to know your thoughts on the following from the Cleveland Police Patrolmen Association Union's website. It's the history of the CPPA, the police union, and it says on July 23, 1968, in the Glenville section of the city, rioting militants murdered three of our own, and a fourth officer died years later as a result of his injuries 
inflicted that day. So we're here to uh, commemorate Glenville 50, and the police union on their website today refers to the rioting militants who murdered police. And that's, that's on their website. And then here's out of the newspaper, the headline reads, Cleveland police officer called Ohio State players N-word in texts to fellow officer, records say, and the police union is defending this officer. So please, your input on how today's news reconciles with where we're going. Please, um, break down your question one more time, because you just told me that they're trying to get justice to how these crazy militants, you know, murdered one of your own, but do you honestly know the facts of that night, how there were drunk policemen at the scene of the shooting, how also other civilians were killed by policemen that were never given justice to? Do you, like, it's in a way where I'm really not understanding. You have to look at it, yes, the, hold on, I'm sorry, but, okay. I know, I know it's not your words. Okay, sir, from can your you website. let her answer the question? Thank you. I know it's from your website and I know it's not your words. I completely understand. Go ahead, Shanoa, go ahead. I know, I'm saying it's not your website, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, I'm not understanding Okay, when a person loses their life, no one deserves that, especially in a violent way, and I completely understand and I commend that. But you need to look at it from all sides, not just from a black militant side, not just from a police department side, not just being a civilian. You need to look at it from all aspects. Like the stories that were told yesterday of how the civilians were not just scared of the police, but just of the rioting as a whole, of how their business, how their community was devastated in every way and aspect, and how it was traumatizing. It was paralyzing to the community. And like, how can I break this down? You sitting here telling me that, well, not, it's not your words. You're sitting here telling me this is from this website and it says, you know, in a way they're trying to commemorate or get justice for this. You gotta look at it from all sides of the board. Yes, he was a police officer. Yes, he was probably doing his job and he was killed in a crossfire, which he probably didn't have anything to do with. But many lives were lost that night. Many businesses were lost that night on both sides of the plane civilian, black militant, police, everything like that. So yes, we should commemorate for every person, that was, every life that was lost, every person, because no one desire, deserves to die in a gun battle. No one deserves to lose their life, also lose their community or lose anyone they love. You are absolutely right. But with that, look at it as a 360, all around the board. You shouldn't just sit here and say, well, this happened and you know, this man lost his life during a rageous gun battle between black militants that uh, shot him, you know, everything like that. I, I just can't understand that because I'm not trying to be biased or give an opinion in a way because this is supposed to be about a conference, but I just can't agree with putting blame on just one side of the board. Okay, so let's I'm hear sorry. from Allison. I can't. So, so I think, sir, um, I'm sorry, what's the gentleman's name? I'm sorry. Um, well, I, th I have the article here, I think. I think just, yeah, I saw the website. So I think the question here was that, how, how can we confront poli police reform when the people who are supposed to be policing our communities are still clinging to, is that the question? Yeah. Okay, well, all right, well let me try to shed some light on, on my opinion on that. Um, I read those words, and I think that that is a picture of police, uh, policing across this country. How do we confront police brutality, and how do we have real conversations with police officers and law enforcement when they cannot take responsibility or even acknowledge their origins? You know, it's, I know a lot of people who refuse to go to meetings with police officers, who refuse to be a part of, a part of the task force meant to police our communities. And, and some people might scoff at that and say, you have to be at the table. But why would I be at the table with someone who doesn't even acknowledge the pain and the trauma that they've caused, right? If we, we have to go before 1968. Why, are, why do we have police officers in this country? 
right? What is the foundation of policing in this country? It's slave catching, right? And so if, and I, I remember I got a chance to talk to FBI director, then FBI director James Comey, and I asked him, how can you try to talk to me about police reform if you can't even acknowledge that your FBI, his, its only original purpose, its only original purpose was to surveil and to, and to intimidate and to oppress? Right? And so it, it's concerning to me. Thank you for sharing that. I had no idea that that's the current police union's website. If they can't walk in truth even today, mm -hmm. how can we talk about tomorrow? Mm. How can we talk about tomorrow? And, and Hello? So, yeah. I'm sorry. So, uh, Mr. Cantor, can I speak? Or is it okay? Yes. Okay. Mr. Cantor, I um, know that that question was probably directed at everybody, but because I'm on the police commission and you're very active in that, I guess you want my opinion on that as well. And I think you have brought this up persistently in meetings. And of course, it's awful, but it is a larger reflection of how re police reform is not happening in this city. Words matter. Mission statements matter, vision statements matter. And so because this is still a part of the a part of the policing statement and a part of how um, because this is still a part of the philosophy of policing, we know that there is a tremendous problem. And as a police commissioner, I will say, and I've always said, that I don't think that my role in a group of 10 civilians and three police officers is going to change that. We have not been designed or set up. The Cleveland Community Police Commission is not designed or set up for success. You have the most dysfunctional group of human beings making decisions on behalf of the community with no resources to do so. We weren't designed, when the consent decree process was happening, the police commission was not designed to have power. So I respect that you continuously bring this up, but I, as a commissioner, have my hands tied. I, I, I don't know that they'll ever change it. The fact that there are three police officers on the police commission shows you that they're more watching than they are trying to change anything. And so I, I care about that, but I also care about the school to prison pipeline. I also care about how the conversation erases black women from being re recipients of state sanctioned violence. So even if, you know, even if we can't change that, or I can't change that as a commissioner. I want you to know that my moves are maybe a little bit more silent than yours, Mr. Cantor. You navigate this world as a white male. You take up white male space. I have to have the love, the care, and also this, the ability to navigate as a black woman, and that's not always loud and boisterous and in people's face. Trust me, I am making moves so that even if that is the statement, that I am protecting the people that are most proximate to me. And so maybe as a commissioner, I can't do this work, but as Amanda King, the activist, the black woman, the person who can write policy, I'm working every day. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, these are young people who I have the honor and privilege of working with um, on a regular and continuous basis in the community. I am so proud of them. <laughs> I'm so proud of y'all. <laughs> And I ask that you take heed to their words. There's not a lot of space where we're given space to talk about what we need and we're giving space to talk about our work. So please take heed, amplify our message. Go back into your communities, into your black clubs, wherever it is that you work and share the words of these young people. Help us to help you as we work to make our communities better. Um, we are... 
We're gearing up to wrap up our time together today. Um, the next person that you will hear on the microphone is another activist and warrior in our community, and he's been on the line for a very long time. Uh, he is Brother Khalid Samad. He will come up to the microphone, and then we will be closed out um, by, our, uh, by song, and that's a wonderful surprise for you. Uh, before Brother Khalid takes the mic, I will ask um, these panelists to stand and join me in the, in the recit reciting the Asada chant, because we have a duty to fight for our freedom, y'all. And these young people up here, they are on the line. They are paying attention to their duty. And I want us to be heard in this space in the way that we feel comfortable on the line and in our activist message. Y'all can join us if y'all want to, if y'all feeling it. I'm gonna stand back here with them because we all together. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to win. We have a duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. We have nothing left but our chains. We have nothing left but our chains. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty. Assalamu alaikum. Ho Hotep, Habari Ghani, Shalom alaikum. Reparations yesterday, I want my money. What's up? How y'all doing? <laughs> I want to first and foremost thank the creator of the universe, who we know by many names, for giving us the space in this place today and animating us and allowing us to be woke. And I am eternally grateful to Almighty God and your higher power, or whatever you call your creative force in yourself or whatever, who animated you and did not leave us without guidance. And we know we stand on the shoulders of those who sacrificed much for us to be here today. And we bear witness to them and their work. And we ask the creator to continue to inspire us and to energize us to be worthy of those soldiers who we stand on. My name is El Haj Amir Khalid Samad, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the fact that this occasion has been organized by a group of people that came together, myself, uh, Dr. Eatman, I always call her, I, I call her Dr. Eatman, and brother uh, Dr. Tim Black, who came together with myself in a discussion after we had just had a rally about the uh, tragic murder of a young man named Thomas Yatsko by an off-duty Cleveland police officer by the name of Graziola. Y'all remember that, right? And to this date, he's not been indicted. There's been no news releases about that. The city of Cleveland punted it to the county sheriff's department, and the county sheriff punted it to a so-called independent prosecutor, and we don't know where the case is at this time. But that happened right near and on this campus. So our work is a continuum. But it's because of the vision that came out of them in trying to pull together a time to commemorate what happened 50 years ago. And not just commemorate it, but analyze it and organize it around something that will give us another step forward in where we're going as a people. I want to apologize to you all for not being here yesterday, because I was scheduled to be here yesterday. I had a conflicting um, schedule with a group of people, of many of them, who were the children of and the survivors of the Glenville Rebellion. And so we had an athletic competition, right? This, this, this is the real, real story. And we hired some referees to uh, Referee the basketball tournament. Y'all know about basketball tournaments in the hood, right? And our referees got a job out in Minna to referee out there because they was paying more money for the referees. So I'm sitting in the gym with about 75 young people, 
and no referee. So y'all know about how much I was able to leave there and come here because it might have been a riot down there if I'd have been down there refereeing those games. So I want to, I want to say on behalf of, uh, you know, this auspicious occasion and those of you who are here and the work that you've been doing, I was a young man on the campus at the shootout in Glenville. I was playing basketball on a basketball court and we were down, you know, the, down, normally the, the Upward Bound program. And they would go get a few of us ghetto kids, you know, out the hood or whatever, and bring them on the campus and allow us to interact with youth from other entities or other neighborhoods. And on a particular day, July 23rd, 1968, while we were out there, it was a real hot evening. And you know, we heard them gunshots. We heard them gunshots. And not just regular gunshots, but loud gunshots. And as a result of hearing those gunshots, we actually put the basketballs down and tried to find out what was going on. And across the grass coming from Wade Park area of Auburndale were three young men with rifles. Their rifles had the muzzle of the rifles, the smokes were still coming out of the rifle bears. And we stood there and watched them because they were the same age as us. I was 16. I think Asu Bey was 16. I think Nandu was 16. I think Lil Akma was right in that age right down. So I'm seeing three me young men that look just like my, myself wearing the same clothes, you know, looking at them with rifles coming across a cut. And we asked them what's going on. They said, it's on. And we knew what they was talking about. So at that point in me, everybody started to break and leave the campus. I got up on Euclid and Ford, which is right down here with a couple of young brothers, because we had to go back to the southeast side of town, if y'all know what I'm saying. And a police officer drove up in a police car while we were standing there and pointed the gun at us and got ready to shoot. And the only reason why he didn't shoot, because there were so many Caucasians standing around, Norma, on the corner of Ford and Euclid, that he didn't shoot the gun. But he hollered at him, I'm going to get you niggas. I got on a basketball outfit, tennis shoes. I'm sweating, and we was wearing them sweatbands. Y'all know them old school sweatbands, right? Y'all knew ones that y'all know nothing about that. That's real old school. Sweatband on the forehead with a police officer, you know, pointing a gun at me. So about five minutes later, as we get in, I'm closing out this, because this is all connected to this concept called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means we're all connected. Intersectionality is an extension of the concept of Ubuntu. And we're sitting here and standing here understanding what these young people said about white supremacy and understand what Dr. Welsing and Neely Fuller said about white supremacy and that you don't understand racism slash white supremacy. Everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. And there's a moral and evil component to that that goes even further. So on that corner, while the bus came down Euclid, we stood there hailing the bus because the 48A, we know him going over to the south side of town, passed us up. We still hear the gunshots. So I said, well, look, we got to run down to the next bus, bus stop, Norm, because at the next bus stop, the bus turns left on Adelbert, and they average about 40 to 50 black women and black men who just got off work standing right there. That's where the bus stopped picking up residents going back across town. We got on the bus and we asked the driver, why did you pass that up? He was white, you know what he said? Get on this bus, nigga. They shooting back there, look on the back of that bus. We understood we were in the throes of something, a rites of passage type of point of view or time at that point. As us as young people, there was something that might have been unprecedented. But obviously, it was not unprecedented because we knew there had been rebellions and so-called riots in other cities. It never rioted in Cleveland during the time that everybody else thought it would go down in April after Martin Luther King was assassinated because of the leadership of Carl Stokes, for the, because of the leadership of African American and white people who worked together during that era, because of the leadership of people who came together to make sure that the streets didn't break out in April after, after Martin Luther King was assassinated. But in closing, there was a speech at Corey. Don was there. Malcolm X, the ballot or the bullet. And he said then, 
that if it don't go down now, it's going to go down later because people are not going to allow themselves to be oppressed, repressed, treated unjustly, and then kicked in the face at the same. At some point, it's going to be an explosion. And it happened on July 23rd. So as I close out, I think that, and don't think that, what we heard today from these young people, it was just like 1968 being heard right over one the Norma. The same kind of language, the same kind of courage, the same kind of vision, the same kind of mother with vision that we heard that came from the mouths of young people in the 60s. And that's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to ask everybody as we close out, I'm going to close out with a little something. I don't know how I can do this generationally or multiculturally or interreligiously, but I'm going to ask everybody to kind of stand up at this time because we're going to come back. We got some more places and spaces. I'm going to come down here with you all. There was a man by the name of Malcolm X, and after he did that ballad or the bullet speech, Don, there was another one. And that speech was called, Wake Up, Clean Up, and Stand Up. Y'all remember that one? Wake up, black man, from your slumber. Wake up, black woman, from your slumber. Wake up, white man and white woman, from your slumber because you don't understand white supremacy because you're never the victim of white supremacy. You don't understand white supremacy the way we understand white supremacy slash racism because we are the victims of white supremacy. But Malcolm said, make no matter of that, still wake up, become conscious. And we're talking about what? We're now what? Stay woke. Stay woke. Stay woke. And after Malcolm did that speech called the ballot or the bullet and the wake up call, wake up, clean up and stand up. There was a man named James Brown. Y'all know him, right? And I think we just used this song a little earlier, right, Sandra? What's the name of that song that you were playing? What was that called? Get Up, Get up by James Brown. Y'all remember that one? Get up from your slumber. Get up from your self-imposed sleep. Get up from your awkwardness. Get up from your dreams. Get up from the blindness of what you don't want to see that was right in front of your face. And the name of the next song was called Soul Power. Y'all remember that? And the words, oh man, I know the words just like it was yesterday, right? What did he say? What we need, soul power. What we want, we got it, soul power. And that particular song was really an act, it was really on the addition of what El Haj Malik stood for. So my ass is to kind of draw a circle right now in an affirmation. Let's show our hands if we can, or hands, shoulders, or whatever it is. We're trying to be energized as we bring up our doc after me, Reverend Bevel's brother, my brother, Brother Bevel's. I don't know if any of y'all know about this, but his brother, Reverend Bevel's, was with us at the gang summit about 25 years ago, right there at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. And he said, what we need is a day of atonement. A young man from California, a member of a gang street organization called the Black Guerrilla Family, was in D.C. with us and had challenged the organizers of the anniversary of the Civil Rights March. And he said, we're going to have to come back here with a million men because he was dissed because they wouldn't let him in the museum or the whatever in the hallway, Don, because he had on one of them rags and he had bloods and crips with LA from him, from LA and vice lords and folks from Chicago. And they physically restrained this young man from going upstairs. And Brother Bevel's brother said, that's why we need a day of atonement. That's why we need a day of of atonement. And atone just means to turn or change your way of thinking and doing something a little bit more harmonious than what had been done before. And I, I thank Almighty God that he's here since we are in a religious institution, Norma, that we should close out with an affirmation. Do I have your permission? Repeat after me. I am. Because God is. And because God is, we are. If our minds can see it, and our hearts can believe it, our wills can achieve it. Minute by minute, hour by hour, 
if we have the vision, we got the power. Minute by minute, hour by hour, if we got the history, we got the power. Minute by minute, hour by hour, if we have the belief, we got the power. Now, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. I feel good about myself and all the brothers and sisters around me. And we will walk with good, and we will talk with good, and that would be real good. Good, better, best. We never let it rest until our best is our better, and our better is our best. Forward ever, backwards never, because we were born in it with the juice to win it. Just for about 10 seconds, we reflect upon all the lives that were lost during Glenville. Not just Nandu and Asu, not Asu, but Lo Ahmed and them that died, but all, everyone who the victims, the police officers that were killed, every, everybody that was injured, and to all those who survived that trauma, that trauma, that deep interracial, inter, internal, intergenerational trauma that has been going through our blood, through our systems, through our souls, through our spirits since the first slave ships came here. Prior to that, there were 50 million Native Americans from the Canadian down to the Caribbean. Now there's less than a million. Trauma, trauma. Those who were incarcerated in all of these program, programs that have incarcerated people of color because of their color and because of the pathology of white supremacy slash racism, which is a public health threat to the planet. Trauma, trauma allows to free ourselves for that. And in the ancient ways of Harambe, we ask you that you raise your arms up seven times and call out Harambe seven times together on the count of three. One, two, three. Harambe, 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 Harambe. And what does Harambe mean? Pulling together. Pulling together. A luta continua. For those of you who do not know me. My name is Mississippi Charles Bevel. Uh, and if you have read through the program, uh, the shortest blurb about whoever was in the program was, was mine. I am an 80-year-old interdisciplinary artist who use art to raise to consciousness the contradictions in our lives. That is, we say some shit and we look around, people look around and see us doing the exact opposite shit. Well, I use my art to raise the consciousness in people's lives so that they can do better. Now, it is true that the United States of America, in spite of however it came together, killing Indians, bringing Africans over to build the thing, was the first democratic republic to be founded on earth. And the foundation was that all citizens would participate in how the thing worked. That was the principle. We were bamboozled, seriously bamboozled. Now, the word dom after freedom can be interpreted in many ways. If you spoke Russian, 
я говорю по-русски, it would mean home or house. It could mean domain as a kingdom. But you're talking about a, a kingdom where freedom reigns. You were bamboozled. You see, freedom is a two-sided coin. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that the concept of America is that you are free to do what you want to do. You're free to go where you want to go. Free to love whom you want to love. Free to be who you want to be. That's just one side of the coin. I'm going to tell you. To be free to do, you have to be free from fear. I look around and I see people trembling like a dog trying to poop persimmon seeds. They're afraid. I can go where I want to go. I can go to New York or go to Chicago. You ain't going to damn place if you are not free from poverty. I'm free to love whom I want to love. You ain't gonna love nobody, and ain't nobody gonna love you if you aren't free from jealousy. I'm free to be what I want to be. I guess the army took that over. You ain't gonna be nothing until you are free from ignorance. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. We have to ignore most of the stuff that hit our senses. You can't take it all in. But when you deliberately decide that you ain't gonna know stuff, you can't be nothing. So I want y'all to uh, help me sing this song. It's called, I Heard a Voice. Now you see, I am not only verbally, I mean vertically aware of things going on in the world. I've been around for 80 years. But laterally as well. I've spent time from three months to 10 years in every state of the United States of America. weeks to four years in at least 10 foreign countries. I have union card to SAG and AFRA. That is, as a stage actress, actor, and Hollywood. I want to mention from the panels here today was when uh, the young lady from Washington was talking about the fire. We all have experienced it from the time we was on a playground. When we looked around and saw something and said, that ain't right. The question is whether we can keep that fire alive. We know when it ain't right. Searching through the memories of my mind, trying to place a face in some lost time, trying to place a word in some lost rhyme, trying to find a voice 
that I heard crying What I see really troubles me Not many people really want to be free Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord Lord, 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 Lord I heard a voice speak to me. Said, come over here to the land of the free. Land of the free and the home of the brave. But I see cowards and I smell slaves. For I see really troubles me. Not many people know how to be free. Oh, Lord, Lord, and love. Lord, 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 and love. You take a gun, say you're gonna make peace. It's like trying to start a love affair by kicking me. Doing what you do while saying what you ought to like trying to wash your face in cold muddy water. What I see really troubles me. Not many people really want to be free. Oh, Lord, Lord, and Lord. People in the street say they want to be free. They cover my eyes and think they're blinding me. Twenty million black children can't even read. Fifty billion black dollars spent for liquor, wine, and weed. What I see really troubles me. Not many people really want to be Oh, Lord, Lord, and Lord. Lord, 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 and Lord. I heard a voice speak to me. Say, come over here to the land of the free. Land of the free, home of the brave. But I see cowards and I smell slaves. What I see really troubles me. Not many people really want to be free. Oh, Lord, Lord, and Lord. Lord, 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 and Lord. Thank you. Uh, just one other word before I leave. I've been back in Cleveland for about seven, eight, nine years now, but very deliberately under the radar. I left the stage and came back for a very specific reason. As I mentioned to y'all yesterday, probably about 160 of the children living out there in Glenville are my nieces and nephews. And I came back with the effort of trying to figure out what could I do. So I'm here now, but one of the things that I observed yesterday that really astounded me, I've worked with many of you since I've been back here but it suddenly occurred to me that there were only two people in the audience that I had ever been inside their homes. Norma Jean and Don, I haven't the slightest idea where you live. I don't know what your children look like. I don't know what you, who your brothers and sisters are. So 
if your name was in that program, you're going to hear from me. I don't mean in the coffee shop. I don't mean in a meeting. I mean in your home. This thing about community is real. I have lived it. And for those of you who don't know me, who just might want to get a little deeper into who is this guy, out there on the table where those leaflets are, you can pick up my card. My face is on one side so you can say, oh, that's who that was, when you look on the other side and see all of my contact information. Because with the young folk, I'm ready to get in the trenches now. And I know they are the ones who are going to provide the energy. Every movement that we've had was started by young folk. Rosa Parks was not the first one to not sit on, that, sit on the back of the bus. It was a child. They're saying that they're ready. And so we should be ready to give them the little information that they need to let their energy do what it has to do. Thank you very much.